Force be with you. So I appreciate Dr. Wyatt for helping put that particular module together. Um, so we have Dr. Pearson here. So we gave a few claps during it, but Dr. Pearson, I'm sorry, Bill Andrews, <laughs> and I know you so well. We're just down the hall, right? <laughs> Dr. Andrews, um, thank you for being here. Welcome to be a part of the academy. Uh, we already started putting him to task for a new logo uh, uh, moniker for the academy. Since we combined all the different uh, colleges on the health sciences campus, we had an old MCG logo, and he's already helped us with that. So thank you all. Um, for those of you who don't know about the academy, I may want to begin thinking about it. As I look around the room, these are the individuals I would anticipate to become academy members. And the idea is these are folks who have excelled on campus in education, and that's either in direct teaching, curriculum, administration, so really pushing health sciences education forward on this campus. And there's a, a process for being evaluated where we have reviewers from the academy on campus here, as well as nationally. So we have national academy members review that application to say, would this person be accepted in their academy, and that's how we make our decisions. So um, I strongly encourage uh, you all to apply. We do it every two years. We have, there's, so the openings will be coming up in a couple years, and I'll send out more details on that. So uh, thank you. Welcome, Dr. Andrews, for being here. Um, and I think, who else is in the academy? I recognize a couple other folks. Um, yes? Hes folks hesitating to raise their hand. There's at least... How many are in the academy? All right. So you see these folks, you might be able to ask them questions about what exactly it is. Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Chu. Um, he is a chair of psychology at Samford Uni University, which is in Birmingham, Alabama. He's been there since 1993. He trained as a cognitive psychologist and has uh, received numerous national teaching awards and has over a dozen publications in teaching, and has a particular interest in um, the assumptions that learners and teachers have about teaching and learning, and then how um, they also carry those misconceptions into their study habits. And so that'll be covered uh, this morning in the workshop, as well as in a uh, student, more student-focused forum this afternoon. Uh, for those of you who are able to attend the afternoon one, I think that's helpful even though it may be more geared towards student perspective, it's helpful to kind of hear what might benefit your students because then you may set up your curriculum, your handouts, and things like that differently as a result of that. So not to take up more of your time, Dr. Chu, thank you for being here and welcome. Whoa. Get this off caught. See if this works. Yeah, great. Okay, thank you so much. Oh, uh, would you mind handing out the hand? Thank you. I appreciate the invitation from Ralph and Tasha to come in and visit. I hope uh, uh, that my talk will, will be valuable to you, and I really want this to be as useful to you as possible. So I'm going to go over some basic uh, cognitive principles of effective teaching. Uh, if there, are, there are, uh, are issues, though, that you're grappling with on uh, Augustana campus that uh, you want to discuss, I'm happy to do that. Um, so please feel free to ask uh, any questions. Uh, and if there are, like I say, if there are issues that, that you all are uh, particularly uh, important to you, um, we're happy to spend more time on those, uh, on those I issues. So uh, let me know how I can be helpful to you. So uh, these are the goals for uh, this morning. I'm going to talk about uh, common teacher and student misconceptions uh, that uh, interfere with student learning. I'm going to discuss cognitive principles of, of learning that the teachers need to understand uh, to be more effective in their teaching and that students need to understand to be more effective learners. Uh, I'm going to discuss some things that you need to know as teachers and then how to put these principles into practice. So we will be doing uh, some activities uh, this morning. We've got some time, so you'll uh, need a pen. I see there are pens out, out there, and then you'll need your, uh, need your handout. Okay, now, uh, I'm a cognitive psychologist, 
Uh, and I suspect that there is a number of a variety of fields that are represented here. Uh, in the film, I already saw medical illustration. I know nothing about medical illustration uh, and a variety of other topics. How can I help you uh, to improve your, your teaching? Well, effective teaching actually takes several different kinds of knowledge. Okay, it takes uh, content knowledge, which is up here, knowledge of your field. This is what we get uh, in our graduate and advanced studies, right? So that's what something we were co probably come into our job with already. Then down here, you need knowledge of how people learn your field. This is called pedagogical content knowledge. Okay, this is the knowledge you gain uh, as you teach when you learn what students have an easy time learning and what students... Uh, uh, concepts are particularly difficult for students to learn. You anticipate uh, misconceptions, you anticipate confusions that students will have, you learn to slow down and spend extra time, maybe have a, a, an extra activity to make sure that students have a good uh, understanding of a certain concept. Then finally, this is where I come in, knowledge of how people learn. Okay, uh, I'm a cognitive psychologist, so I study uh, the, the human cognitive system about uh, what uh, the human cognitive system is good at doing and what its major constraints and weaknesses are. And as you design pedagogy, you must take the um, strengths and weaknesses of the cognitive system into account. Okay, if your uh, pedagogical choices, if your teaching methods don't mesh with the strengths and weaknesses of the cognitive system, it's going to fail, no matter how uh, logical it is, no matter how well-intentioned it is, no matter how well-explained it is. If you don't take advantage of what the mind does well, and if you don't compensate for what the mind does poorly, then your, perform your learning is not, or your teaching is not going to be effective. So this is where we're going to spend uh, most of our time uh, today. All right. So most of my work is predicated on one basic assumption, and that is that all teachers have a mental model of how people learn. Okay, you base your pedagogy on a mental model that you have on how students learn best. Now, you may not be able to articulate this model, but everyone's got one. Okay, the model that you have determines the pedagogy that you choose, and it determines how you implement it. Right? So if you believe uh, that uh, learning occurs best when students learn from each other, uh, when learning occurs in collaboration, you're probably going to pick more group-based kinds of, of methods. You're going to use uh, maybe uh, uh, you know, group um, uh, like uh, problem-based learning or, or uh, group discussions uh, more. But if you believe that students learn best when a, a knowledgeable expert explains things clearly to you, uh, to students, then you're probably going to use more traditional lecture-based methods, right? So that's how your mental model dictates your choice and implementation of, of, um, of methods. Now, that model also allows you to uh, design interventions if there's a student that is really having a hard time understanding or if something goes wrong with your class. So, you know, you, we, we all make presentations sometimes that just don't go over. The class is just completely befuddled about, you know, you, this, this lecture that you thought was just brilliant and all of a sudden the students just don't understand it. Um, so how do you compensate for that? How do you uh, uh, sort of recover from that kind of mistake? You rely on your mental model, right? Um, you think about what was missing uh, from your presentation and you compensate for it. Now, to the extent that your mental model is accurate and complete, then you'll be an effective teacher. But if your mental model is simplistic or it's incomplete uh, or it's got a misconception, it's going to hurt your teaching. You can't compensate for a factor that's not part of your mental model, right? Okay. Now, I'm here to tell you that most teachers base their pedagogy on untested assumptions faulty intuitions and misconceptions. So I'm here to tell you in the politest way possible uh, that chances are you don't know as much as you think you do about, about uh, teaching effectiveness, okay? All right, so we'll see if that's correct. And that'd be great, by the way, uh, if you already uh, knew everything I was going to, to tell you. Now, not only do you base your teaching on uh, how you think students learn best, students also base their own uh, learning based on, on how they think they learn best. Right? So, you know, they make judgments all the time. Do I really need to go to class today or can I get someone else's notes? Do I really need to read all this or can I just like read the summaries or, or look at the, the, the key terms and will that be just as good? Right? Don't you, uh, uh, you know, have students who come ask you like, well, I know the, like you've got this chapter assigned, but what do you really want me to read? You know, what do I really have to read? Right? So this is their, their model. It's like, you can't be serious that you really want us to read all this, this stuff. Right? Uh, so 
This mental model determines their learning effectiveness. It determines, you know, how they study, when they start studying, when they believe that they've mastered material. And once again, to the uh, extent that their model is accurate, they'll be good effective learners. But to the extent that their model is inaccurate, it has misconceptions, or is simplistic, then it's going to hurt them uh, as, as learners. And part of our job as teachers is to correct the mental models that our students come in with. Okay, we at least need to be aware of their misconceptions and try and combat them and correct them, right? Because uh, just giving them content isn't enough if they are using poor study strategies or if they have mistaken beliefs about how they, they learn, right? So that's something that a good teacher does. All right, so let's look at, at uh, sort of a student mental model. I'm, I'm talking here about um, uh, typical traditional undergraduates. Uh, I don't know how many of you like teach traditional undergraduates, but uh, uh, let's let's kind of start with that as our as our uh, focus. So a typical incoming college student, traditional college student, uh, graduate from high school. They have a GPA uh, on average of 3.0. That's the average uh, national average. Uh, chances are they go to college is probably above 3.0. Um, so they probably passed a high school exit or graduation exam. Right? They did something that they allowed them to graduate. They've been tested on their scholastic achievement every year, probably since fourth grade. And they've done well enough to proceed to the next grade. And then they probably took some sort of entrance exam, like the ACT or the SAT, in order to be admitted to college. So what that means is that these students have a long history of academic success. Right? They have taken tests. They have done pretty well, and they've passed their classes, and so they are used to, to being academically successful, right? Now, here is the uh, data from the latest ACT testing about uh, the percentage of students that are adequately prepared for college-level work. So uh, these are, are students who achieve a certain benchmark uh, where they've got a 90% uh, chance, 90% uh, probability of making a C- minus or better. Uh, in certain, cl certain class. So for English, 64% of the students who took the ACT uh, made that benchmark. Uh, for reading, it goes down to less than half, about 46%. Uh, mathematics, it drops into 42%. And then science is down to uh, about a little more than a third, 38%. And if you look for students uh, that are uh, college ready in all four areas, that's a roughly a quarter of the students who took the ACT. Okay. So what that means is that the vast majority of students are actually unprepared for college level work in at least one area, right? So what that means then is the typical college, entering college student is inadequately prepared for college level work in at least one area, and they are blissfully unaware of this fact, right? They are overconfident in their preparation and their abilities, right? So I'm suspecting that when students tour the beautiful Augustana University campus, they do not ask, well, where is the study skills laboratory? Because I intend to struggle once I get here, right? <laughs> they do not, that, that's not what they want to know, right? Uh, so students uh, are unprepared, and the freshman year, the first year, becomes a, a, a sort of a rude shock for them. And, you know, if you're like me, you get messages like this. These are actual email messages I've gotten. I came to the test really confident I knew the material, but it didn't show that on the test. You ever heard something like that be before? Right, okay. Uh, the reason I've stuck with this course as long as I... They put in a lot of effort, okay, and the exam just didn't test well. So effort equals, like, you know, achievement. If I put in the, this amount of effort, then somehow I deserve a passing grade, right? And this last one, I, you know, I was prepared, felt prepared going into the first two exams, but scored much lower than I wanted. To be completely honest, I'm not wanted to come to this class because I don't feel it's worth it. I'm not going to do well anyways, okay? And, and this, is, this is really an alarming message because what it's saying is if I'm not going to do pass, I'm just going to withdraw. Okay, because a lot of students, this is their first failure experience. And they, they want to avoid that kind of negative experience. So they do the most, the, the least constructive thing possible. They, they stop going to class, right? These are your students who, like, they fail three exams before they come and talk to you, right? And it's like, well, what can we do? Well, like, very little now. You, you know, the, the semester is almost over, right? So, uh, students know how to cope with this, this kind of, kind of failure. Okay. Now, should this, should this concern us? It depends on what your, your belief is the primary goal for, for, for teaching, why you entered this, this profession. If you believe that, that you, the primary goal of teaching is to present information to students who are solely responsible for learning, then this is not your problem because what's happening is the students are failing uh, and it's not your responsibility if they learn the material or not. You're just simply supposed to present the information that's current and accurate 
uh, and well organized. Okay, but if you believe that the goal of teaching is to help your students develop a sophisticated and generative understanding of your subject area so that they can use this knowledge to sort of uh, analyze the world, to think about the world in a more sophisticated way, then this is a big problem for you. Okay, uh, you look at teaching as, as a, and learning as a, as a partnership between you uh, and the student. So the student has to do their part and you have to do your part. Right, and what we look at is uh, it, we gauge success in terms of how well the students have learned the material. Then this is a, a, a big issue. And I'm going to argue that the second goal is really what we should be focusing on because uh, it, teaching has a huge impact on learning for better or for worse. So even if you believe the first one, you're actually having the second impact. You are having a powerful impact on, uh, on student learning for better or for worse. Okay, all right. So how do we help students make the, this transition uh, into college? There's several different uh, uh, possible methods. Remediation is one. Uh, we have developmental courses. Developmental courses are expensive and um, students don't like them. Uh, and the outcomes are not particularly promising, although there are, there's a lot of innovative work uh, in this, this area. If students start in a remedial program, uh, it greatly reduces their odds of successfully completing uh, a four-year college degree. Okay. Uh, we can have tutoring and, and study tips. Yeah? Is that because they were not well prepared for college, or is it because they, they aren't able, they're not engaged, or... What, what is the reason that the remediation program doesn't work? There's, there's probably uh, multiple uh, reasons for that. Uh, part of it is like stigma. They, you know, so it, it makes them feel like that they're, they're, you know, they start out like they feel like they're like don't belong here, and that's that's part of it is that they, they feel like, uh, you know, what they're saying is the college is saying is that you know I'm not part of this this large university. That's part of it. You know, poor study skills, poor preparation is, is certainly another part of it. Absolutely. So there's multiple reasons for that. Florida, by the way, uh, just tried um, uh, an experiment where they made remediation uh, uh, optional so that students could opt out of remediation if they, if they wanted to. And uh, the, the research coming out of there shows that uh, students who need remedial courses really need it. They didn't do very well if they went directly into it. But the students who went through remedi remediation didn't really do any better than the students who didn't go through remediation. So it's... It, it just shows how complex the problem problem is. So they need something, but the question is, what what do we need to give them? Yeah. Following up on that question, in another institution uh, where we have dealt a lot with students at risk, mm -hmm. uh, students at risk of failing, often because of poor high school backgrounds, uh, but not wanting to base entrance uh, acceptance or rejection only on scores and things like that, we would take a lot of these students at risk or require remediation. Mm -hmm. Their entry uh, ACT scores were substantially lower mm -hmm. uh, than those that got accepted without that. So I wonder truly if this is simply that, or for a large part, that they are just not prepared mm -hmm. no matter what, uh, what you're going to do. So the question is is whether the problem with remediation is is problem just that they're they're not prepared, their, their ACT scores are, are lower, but when given the bright, perhaps the kind of support, then they can be as successful as students who who don't require the remediation. Is that? Well, in, in, in other words, are you are you setting is the institution setting itself up for failure? Mm -hmm. Invested a lot of resource, money, time, faculty time in mm -hmm. these programs, but the the, the chances of, of succeeding are so low, given that many oh. of these students are just not ready. Okay, and so if, if, the, if what you're saying is that if the, if the students just really are not prepared for college level work, then the remediation can't, uh, perhaps a, a semester of remediation can't uh, compensate for like years and years of, of under, being unprepared. And that's certainly an argument that, that was the argument in, in, um, uh, in one of the arguments in Florida where they said the remediation is not going to help, you should just go ahead and put them in and let them sink or swim on their, on their own. I'm, I'm going to argue for a, a, an alternative to remediation. Uh, I don't think we can get rid of it, but I'm going to argue for a third one, uh, which is uh, we teach them how uh, to be more effective learners. I'm going to argue that, at least for some of these students, part of the problem is ineffective learning strategies. Right? And if we can correct the learning strategies, we can give them the best possible chance 
uh, at being successful. Uh, another approach, by the way, uh, used at, uh, that's, that's being used at one university in Canada is actually having multiple entry points where uh, students who um, are uh, uh, don't uh, go th uh, aren't accepted through the uh, through the uh, traditional route actually uh, can take like a semester worth of courses which are not labeled as remedial but but simply labeled as like alternative entry and if they can pass those then they actually are automatically uh, ad admitted so it kind of gets around that that stigma uh, and um, you know it, it helps the students to kind of make that transition who may be like first generation. Uh, students who don't have that kind of college level background. First generation students, as I'm sure you know, uh, have, a, have problems because they, they, they don't have that role model, uh, that help from, from parents who can help them make that transition. Okay, so I'm arguing for the third one. If we can correct their ineffective learning strategies, we can increase the number of students who can succeed at college. And that's kind of what um, I'm talking about. And I have a, a series of uh, videos on YouTube and the references is in the resources section of your of your handout uh, on helping students to uh, to study. Um, so there's a, a, a five videos. There's actually six videos. There's an introductory video uh, that's optional, and then five videos. Uh, each one's about six or seven minutes long, uh, and you can use these in your classes to help your students to uh, uh, improve their studying. So I designed them. Uh, so that um, to save you time, basically. So if you have students who are struggling uh, with study strategy, you can assign them to watch certain of the videos, and then uh, that way you can spend your time with the students instead of explaining learning strategies, discussing how to use them in your class. So uh, please be uh, aware of these and, and, and feel free to make use of uh, of them. Okay, um, they are they are free and available uh, for your use. You can embed them in your uh, learning management systems. Uh, list them on your syllabi, however you want to use them. Okay. Yes? Is that applicable just for adult learners or mm -hmm. for younger learners? No, it's, they're used in AP high school classes uh, and actually uh, regular high school classes as, as well. As a matter of fact, uh, they, they've been viewed over a million times. And uh, so I, I took my family out to get ice cream one time, and the kid behind the eyes looks and goes, you're Dr. Chu. And so he is, he's taking AP history at the local high school. And uh, so uh, anyway, and, and now my son is taking AP history. And if they show the, uh, the videos, I'm sure my, my son, my 15-year-old son will die of humiliation uh, from that. Anyway, OK. So uh, let's talk about some of the content that's in those videos that you need to be aware of. Uh, that help you uh, as you as you work with students. Here are uh, four of the uh, most common misunderstandings or misconceptions students bring with them to the classroom. And if you're aware of them, then you can uh, work more effectively with students to overcome them uh, and uh, to become more effective learners. The first one is that learning is fast. Uh, students uh, coming out of high school, especially, believe that that uh, they can study material like the night before. They you know. Uh, and, then, and learning is, is very quick. They, they grossly underestimate the amount of time it takes to, to learn. If you talk to a typical college student about, uh, you know, planning for uh, uh, studying for an exam, they're going to plan out their study so that they've read all the material once, like right before the exam, as if reading it once is all that's required. Okay. Uh, when I uh, teach general psychology, I always, you know, uh, tell them like four days before the exam, if, if you plan to do well, then you should have completed all the reading today. Okay, and you should spend at least three days in review, right? Because you learn more in review than you learn the first time you're, uh, you're um, uh, reading material. Uh, the same is true, by the way, for writing assignments. Uh, students uh, wait way too late to start the writing assignments, uh, and as a result, they end up doing a sort of a last-minute slipshod job, right? So uh, there, was a, there was a survey done a number of years ago on students, like when they started uh, writing, you know, uh, writing assignments, guess what the, the, the most common day to start a writing assignment was? It would be when? It would be the day before. Yeah, and then the second most common was the day it, that it was actually due, right? So uh, they don't really think about how long these things will, uh, will actually take, right? Okay, the second one is that being good at a subject's matter of inborn talent rather than hard work. Some of you may be familiar with the work of Carol Dweck on, uh, on fixed versus growth mindsets. Um, Okay, I don't have a, a slide of that. Um, so uh, Dweck makes a, a, a distinction between a fixed mindset, which 
Uh, these are people who believe that they are just naturally good or bad at something, and, and, and you're either born with a certain kind of talent or you're not. So you're either naturally a good writer or you're not a good writer. There's nothing you can do to change that. You're naturally good at math or bad at math. I teach statistics, so I hear this all the time. You know, I'm just bad at math, okay? Uh, or, you know, I'm not good at science, right? So that's a fixed mindset, this idea that we are born with a certain aptitude and there's nothing we do to change it. We contrast that with a growth mindset, which says that your ability is a direct result of the amount of effort that you put in. Okay, the harder you work, the more you can achieve. Okay, and a fixed mindset uh, has negative outcomes for, for learning. Uh, students tend to avoid challenges because if they have a failure experience, that means that there's nothing they can do, and they tend to withdraw, just like that, that, that message. Because, you know, if, if I fail at this course, it means I'm bad at this, and there's nothing that I can do. If you have a growth mindset, however, uh, those students tend to embrace challenges, like I have to work extra hard at this. So when students uh, will tell me, you know, I'm you know, really bad at math, he said, no, that means you have to spend extra time working on math. You have to make sure that you keep up with this. Okay, so don't let students get by with that fixed mindset. Okay, really nurture a growth mindset. When students um, uh, write a, a good paper, I don't say, this shows you're a good writer, or this is really well written, I'd say, you know, you put a lot of effort into this and it really shows, right? So the feedback we give will really nurture uh, growth versus fixed mindset. And we really need to work in that, that, uh, that, that growth mindset. Question. How do you spell Dweck? Dweck. Uh, let's see, I don't have it there. So D-W-E-C-K, okay? Uh, and there's a ton of, of her work on the internet. So there, it's very easy to locate that, that sort of thing. Okay. Yes. Uh, you know, a lot of the times, like especially like in medicine, there's some disciplines that require hand eye coordination, dexterity, things like that. Mm -hmm. And we call that like, oh, they have good hands, you know, they're gonna be good at this or whatever, blah blah blah. Is that something that is an inborn talent or is mm -hmm. that something, you know, different? So like when we apply I can easily see how you're talking about math, science, and those things and Yeah. Well, okay. There, there are there are different starting points. There's different like levels of, of starting points. So intuitively, you may understand uh, certain things uh, better than others. Uh, but F, uh, the research shows that 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 uh, practice, deliberate practice of getting better, can actually overcome pretty large deficits, uh, pretty large differences in, in sort of inborn talent levels. So people who have a fixed mindset think that there's that that's not possible, but the, the the evidence is actually quite the opposite. That we're actually much more trainable than we tend to tend to think we we are. identify uh, people who are talented in certain kind of ways very early on, and then they start uh, training them uh, early on. And he uh, did some estimates, and he found that, that uh, for the Chinese players, uh, they started so much earlier than U.S. volleyball players that they had actually uh, practiced about 100,000 times, like, like, you know, drills, like just like spike practices uh, than the typical American player. All right, and so it's not that the Chinese players were more talented, it was just they had 100,000 more extra practice trials. So uh, to, I'm, I'm not saying you, you, know, you can uh, always overcome those differences in physical abilities, but you know, if, if you do enough deliberate practice, then you can overcome quite a, few, quite a bit of difference, more than we tend to think. Okay. But you know, I'm never gonna be you know, LeBron James, or no matter how hard I try. That's, there are certain deficits that you just simply are not gonna overcome. Yeah. Mm -hmm. a portable device. Mm -hmm. So instead of wanting to learn something, it has to be available uh -huh. right now when I need to know it. Mm -hmm. and, and that sort of gets in the way of that whole idea of deliberate practice. Or, yeah. Uh, so, practice. 
I can probably, sorry, I keep on forgetting to repeat that. Uh, so, the, you know, this is at odds with sort of the I want it now uh, kind of, kind of, and that's true. I mean, we are, uh, we are battling that, that kind of I want it now, I want it immediately. You know, there should be an app for everything, right? Uh, so we want this instant gratification. And you, you have to, you know, part, that's, that's part of what we have to do as, as teachers, though, is to convince students that they need to put in the effort, but the effort is worthwhile. And this is something that a lot of teachers don't think about, is like, I'm just teaching my subject matter. Now, I find this interesting, so of course, if you're in my class, you must find this interesting. Uh, and we forget that, you know, one of the reasons they're in our class is because they needed a general ed requirement and they had an opening, you know, and this was the only thing that, 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 that kind of fit their, their schedule. So part of what we need to do is to convince them that this is really, that the effort is really worthwhile here. And this is something that we often forget. But absolutely, there's, there's plenty of, of um, parts of aspects of, of popular culture that argue against just, you know, uh, of this. But the, the, the good news is that the students who get this, who understand that they have to work hard at, at, to achieve a, a goal, are going to have an advantage once they, they leave here because they know what's, you know, that, that they have to put in the hard work for, to, to accomplish that, that competency. Okay. All right. Boy, great questions. All right. Um, then the last one uh, is I'm good at multitasking, especially during classes starting. Talking about popular culture. Okay, uh, multitasking is kind of uh, uh, the bane of our, our uh, uh, you know, digital existence, right? We have, uh, we carry around a device that's indispensable that also is a constant source of distraction uh, for us. And students especially uh, are subject to distraction. They think they're good at multitasking when in fact uh, the evidence is quite clear uh, that we're terrible at multitasking. Okay, uh, attention is, is one of the major constraints of the, the cognitive system uh, we can only pay attention to a small portion of, uh, of a scene at once. So even though I can take in, I can see the whole room, I can only focus my awareness on a small part of the, of the room, one small uh, section at a time. And anything that distracts from that is going to hurt my, my performance. We are not built to multitask. It's just a, an overwhelming finding. Um, now, uh, there are a very small percentage of people who are actually are actually pretty good at multitasking, but they're not the people who think they're good at multitasking. Uh, there was actually research on this, uh, which uh, uh, by a guy named Clifford Nass out of Stanford, which showed a negative correlation between the belief in being good at multitasking and actually being good at multitasking. So uh, people who think they're best at multitasking are actually the worst uh, at it. Students think that they're good at multitasking because uh, they've never actually compared it to uh, focusing one thing at a time. And we're, we're going to actually do an activity in that uh, in just a minute here. Um, so let me tell you about a couple things, aspects of, of uh, multitasking that are important for you to know as, as uh, teachers. Okay, the first one is inattentional blindness. Okay, uh, what happens in intentional blindness uh, is that uh, we are unaware of, of anything that happens outside of our focus awareness. So I can be looking at a scene, but I can only focus on a small uh, a portion of that scene. Okay, plenty of things happen outside of my focus awareness, but I'm not aware of that. Okay, and not only am I not aware of it, but I believe that I've seen everything. Okay, so students uh, will be like, um, you, know, uh, you know, on the, you know, texting during class, Okay, and uh, they will not be learning, but they won't realize what they've missed. They think they've actually been doing a pretty good job of paying attention because of inattentional blindness, right? They think that they haven't missed anything when, in fact, they've missed missed uh, quite a bit. Uh, all those distractions in class are, are really hurt hurt learning. Um, so uh, this is uh, an example of intentional blindness that I like. Uh, these are these are people on a whale watching tri uh, cruise off the California coast, and I don't know if you can see it very well, but they're all oriented to the right. So sort of looking for a whale, uh, and they miss the whale that's, that's right there by, uh, that's behind them. So we can miss a lot of information that's kind of uh, outside of our focus awareness. That's inattentional blindness. Uh, another um, problem is inattentional, uh, is attentional blink. Okay, think about a time when you were really focused on an important task, right? And then you got distracted. Someone said something to you or someone needed something uh, or the phone uh, went off or something like that. You can't immediately go back to full focus, right? It takes four or five minutes to refocus yourself. That's attentional blink, okay? Uh, there's this refractory period where we simply can't have uh, uh, full focus again. It takes time to shift the focus of our attention. Right. So this is a study uh, that was done by Rosen uh, that I like a lot. 
he had subjects uh, learning short lists of, of easy uh, learned uh, 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 items and words, and then at some point they had to either uh, answer or send a text. Now, as soon as that text kind of came in, their learning dropped about 25 to 30 percent. Okay, and this is a simple test. This isn't like learning new information, but it took four to five minutes for the learning to recover and go back. So what that means is that every distraction costs you five minutes, right? So 12 distractions uh, and you've wasted an hour. Okay, that is how easy it is to, to waste time uh, with distractions. And distractions happen all the time. And the, the, the sad thing is it doesn't have to be our distraction. Uh, there's uh, research that shows that, you know, you have a class that's learning uh, and someone's cell phone goes off. It's not even your cell phone. And it lowers the learning of everyone in the class. Okay, uh, we probably all had the experience where you got students who have laptops in the classroom and someone's like, you know, shopping on Amazon or checking Facebook. It not only does it hurt their learning, it hurts the learning of everyone behind there that's kind of following along on what they're, what they're doing. So any distraction is going to, going to hurt. All right. So I want to show you kind of what the cost of multitasking is. So we are going to do an activity, uh, which is on your hand, uh, handout, I think. Uh, if you go to, the cost, uh, no, it's the, let's see, okay, all right, go to uh, unitasking versus multitasking, that activity there, okay, in order to do this, you're going to have to pair up with someone, and you're going to test each other, you can just follow the directions, uh, you don't have to really fill out the, the little uh, Likert school questions so much, you can just kind of read through it. But just do the task and see how, what the, how well you multitask. You're going to need a stopwatch for this. Uh, if you've got a smartphone, then you've got a stopwatch. Uh, you may need a calculator, which also you have on your smartphone. So just pair up with someone around you. If you, if you don't know the people around you, now's a good chance to introduce yourself. And, um, and uh, let's see how well you do. Yeah, if you want a group of three, that's fine, too. Do you need a hand out? All right, so we'll just give you a few minutes.
Everyone about finished? Okay. Okay. What? Okay, is everyone about finished? Okay, how did it go? Are you really good at multitasking, or are you really bad at it? Bad. Yeah. Really bad. Okay. So if you had a negative number, then you you had a cost of multitasking. So like negative 100% means it doubled your time to to do that. Negative 200% tripled your time. You know, 300%. And usually it's like about 300% or so is pretty average for uh, for the cost of multitasking. Now think about this. This is like two very simple overlearned tasks. Counting down from 10. And you know, doing not even the whole alphabet, like half the alphabet, right? Now imagine the cost of multitasking if you are doing something effortful, for like trying to learn information that you've never learned before. That's something completely novel for you. It just shows you how 
difficult it is to multitask. Did you really like find that much more effortful, like doing the multitasking, you know, like back and forth? And because I, I I can tell the people are looking up, you know, they're just really focusing on on the, this kind of thing. Okay, anyone good at it? Like just like fat, just as fast, or pretty good at it? Okay, all right. So this is the way multitasking works. So if you uh, uh, if you're a student and you study and there's a lot of distractions around, like you know you've got Facebook open and your your phone is on the desk and it's buzzing because there are text alerts and things like that, it's going to slow you down three or four times uh, your regular study strat uh, skills. So you can take a task that uh, takes 30 minutes to do if with full concentration. And it will expand it out to like at least 90 minutes. This is conservative. This is like taking three times longer uh, to study under distraction. Okay, but if you can teach yourself to study with complete focus, you can actually do 30 minutes of of study and have 60 minutes of actual free time, guilt-free free time to do it. So this is what happens when we study under under multitasking conditions. It just slows us down uh, tre tremendously. Students, like I say, think they're good at multitasking because they do it all the time, but uh, when they actually compare how they do focusing on a task versus multitasking, they virtually always do much more poorly uh, doing the multitasking. By the way, uh, if you want uh, a copy of this uh, activity, uh, you're welcome to uh, uh, have it. Just email me and I'll be happy to send you the slides, the, the uh, materials, anything that you'd like. Okay? All right. So there's no evidence that multitasking is, is as effective as concentrating one task at a time. All right, the evidence is overwhelming that multitasking hurts your learning. And good study strategies are highly effortful. So multitasking is especially uh, damaging when you're trying to study something that's novel and difficult to understand. And even as small distractions will significantly reduce in learning. And what's really key here uh, is that resisting temptation is a distraction. So if your phone goes off and you think, you know, I'm not going to answer that because I'm trying to study here. You've just distracted yourself, right? So uh, the best thing to do is simply get the, those distractions out of uh, your way so that there is no possibility of, of, of distraction. This is part of the problems with uh, e-books, uh, are, which are, are becoming more and more popular because they are, are cheaper. Uh, the, the research shows that it actually, uh, students uh, take longer to uh, uh, read uh, e-books than regular books to the same level of comprehension. Yeah? So in, in medical education, there's a lot of discussion about the merits of showing up for lectures as mm -hmm. opposed to staying at home and watching the recorded videos online. Mm -hmm. Is there anything, any research as to where students are more susceptible to distraction and more tempted into multitasking, whether it's in a lecture hall with 100 other people mm -hmm. or at home? surrounded by their toys? Well, I mean, part of it is how they, uh, the question was like uh, taped you know, video lecture where you can, they can watch it at home uh, versus like going to a lecture hall and they've, they, then they've got the other kinds of distractions with their classmates and, and their devices and things like that. And this is, uh, there's not a simple answer to this kind of question. Uh, there, there's no question that when you're at home and no one is watching you that, that there, there's, and you're at home, you're surrounded by those kinds of temptations. Uh, as a teacher, you have um, you have more control over your classroom in terms of of, uh, of monitoring the level of attention. So, uh, a, a good teacher will be able to monitor the level of attention when it starts to wander. You can actually take a break. Uh, so, for example, some teachers will have like a five minute period after they've they've uh, they've lectured for a while, and let's say we're going to take a you know five minutes to give you a chance to update your notes, to come up with questions. And, and things like that, so that way the students can kind of review and reflect and ask questions. That's something that obviously you can't do. So you have more control over the learning atmosphere in class. Um, I tend to actually look at technology as being a good, uh, I mean, it, there's no question that some students can, can learn better under like watching YouTube videos and things like that, but you gotta think that the default way that students view videos is to be entertained. They're very passive when they're doing it. Uh, so, you know, we watch cat videos to be entertained. And that same mindset comes when they are watching videos that are instructional where they should be paying attention, but their natural inclination is to sit back and be passive. 
Okay, in, in the classroom, you can actually have activities, you can have, uh, you know, uh, uh, understanding concept checks, things like that, which will refocus them and force them to think through information deeply. So I really think classroom has the ability to, to hold their attention and to, make, and to uh, help them to process information deeply. Um, so I look at it, technology as, as its, its better role is to actually supplement. So if they miss things, in the classroom, they can go back and, and reinforce their, their learning with the technology. So that's, I think that's, to me, that's optimal, but it's gonna vary from one person to another. We've just gone through the, the, uh, the, uh, the fad of MOOCs, you know, massive open online uh, courses, and um, yeah. I just had a, a quick uh, response to that, that same yeah. okay. point before sure. you move on. I had seen a study about a year or two ago looking at um, not whether you're looking at other videos and things during a lecture, but if the person next to you or in the row ahead of you flips something up and they're doing Sudoku or chatting, you know, looking at Facebook, that that distracts you mm -hmm. as much as what you're trying to pay attention to the lecturer and you have no control over what your classmates are doing in front of you. It sort of reminds me when I go to a theater and I see iPhones out, the whole experience of going to a movie theater is gone. Mm -hmm. Whereas at home, at least you have control of that. So at least in one study, they showed how much yeah. others' activities impact you. Yeah, and a, a great point. And what I'm saying, you know, there are certain people who are really good at like you doing MOOCs. They, they tend to be uh, really good uh, uh, self-learners. Uh, so one of my friends said Abraham Lincoln would have loved MOOCs. So. Because yeah, he was he was a, a you know a self motivated learner, but the vast majority of people are actually are, are are not that disciplined, and and so if they are disciplined, then that's great. They can learn off of any platform. But the great thing about being in a classroom is you actually can control their level of attention. I think a lot of teaching is actually controlling attention. Uh, you knowing where in managing the attention the of the class. So you should always be aware of where the attention is of your class and you should always have a single focus for it. One of the most common mistakes that neophyte, you know, novice teachers make is they actually fight uh, their, their like PowerPoint. They've got a PowerPoint up here and they're talking over here and the students are, are, uh, are kind of trying to figure out which, where, which place they're supposed to focus. Uh, as, as an example of that, uh, I had a new teacher a couple of years ago. Uh, she was a graduate student. She was teaching her the first time. Uh, and when you teach her the first time, the, the book publishers give you these, these slides that are commercially produced that you can, you can just drop into your, your PowerPoint presentation. So she was talking about Pavlovian conditioning, which is like, you know, dogs salivating. And of course, she had this stock photo of these cute puppies up, and she was trying to explain Pavlovian conditioning. So I'm in the back of the room looking like, you know, every student in there is looking at the cute puppies and thinking about all the cute puppies I've ever seen, and they're not paying attention to, uh, to, to the teacher in that. So we can't sort of fight our, our PowerPoint. We've got to really know where the teacher's attention is at all times. Quick, there was a quick, question. Quick question. Uh, yeah, a quick question and a comment for your insight. Uh, so one of the questions is, so what do you think about, I guess, at least for me, sometimes it's good to focus in a very quiet place, and sometimes I do best in a Starbucks with some noise that's really, I think the meaning of noise is important. Like if it's my cell phone, yes, it's distracting on my email. Mm -hmm. But but if I'm sitting in a kind of listening to some music and it's really not concerning me or doesn't have anything to do with me, sometimes I can focus better. What do you think? Yeah, uh, and this, this is uh, a common sort of question. Like, so sometimes you actually, you know, can be okay if you're in a, an atmosphere let, like there's a buzz in the background. Um, and then students often ask me, what about listening to music while, while studying? Okay, it's a similar kind of, a, kind of an issue. Uh, if the buzz in the background is something that's very familiar to you, so, and you're habituated to it, so you spend a lot of time at Starbucks, then you're, you're gonna be more effective at studying uh, uh, or, or working there. Because you know, it's, it's a, it becomes a, a sort of a background noise that you habituate to. It's not going to matter. Um, uh, and, and actually, uh, the, the good thing about that is that buzz in the background uh, d uh, will drown out other kind of distractions that you might have, you know. So you don't ha you're in a place where the distractions are predictable and they're, they're familiar as opposed to being in a place where the, the distractions are unfamiliar. Uh, and that's where it really becomes uh, difficult to, uh, to ignore. 
Uh, as far as listening to music is concerned, um, uh, the, the research is quite clear that silence is actually the best way to focus. Uh, and music is a distraction, but music actually has some benefits to it. Uh, so that um, uh, music can uh, sort of uh, raise your level of motivation, it can be uh, raise your, your mood. So, you know, like when I'm grading papers, I kind of like to have music because it just like get, you know, motivation to get me through this. Uh, I think we all hate grading papers, right? And so it kind of gets you through this. Uh, also, if you're a student and you're living in a dorm, uh, you've got tons of distractions and the music will actually drown out the, the, the even worse distractions. Uh, so I tell students, you know, it's a cost-benefit analysis. So if the benefits outweigh the cost, then you can listen to music. I, uh, what I tell them, though, is, is to listen to music that is familiar and they're habituated to that's not demanding. So uh, with no lyrics, you know, and music that is just very comfortable and familiar to you. And if, if you actually go on YouTube or, or Pandora, uh, or Spotify, they actually have these these long playlists of lyricless music f just for studying. Like on YouTube, there's like a six-hour jazz, you know, you know, ly lyricless jazz thing just for this kind of kind of purpose, kind of thing. Okay. Yes. Okay. Is there? An, I'm guessing there's there's data behind how long mm -hmm. those kind of chunks of, just, of mm -hmm. concentration time are optimal for learning. Yeah, it's not a set time. I mean, uh, it, it depends on, on how familiar you are with it. If, if you're more familiar with it, you can go for a longer. But the question was like, is there an optimal time period before you need to take a take a break? And uh, you know, certain tasks that are familiar and engaging, you can go for a much longer period. Other tasks that are, you know, uh, that are not as engaging and and you're no, less familiar with, you probably have to take more frequent breaks. A really good learner will monitor, like, you know, it, they will know when their eyes are moving over the page, but they're not actually learning anything, and then they kind of will force themselves to take a break, that sort of thing. And, and that's exactly what you have to do in the classroom. You have to, a, a good teacher is constantly on the fly adjusting, uh, and they're really good at monitoring what the level of, of attentiveness of the class is. Uh, a, a, a weaker teacher is just going to, like, you know, boldly moves on whether the, whether the students are with that teacher or, or not. So, uh, in, a, in a typical second year microbiology class, lecture class here in a large uh, auditorium, whether they're 50 students or 200 students, quite a few of them have their laptops in front of them. Yes. Uh, now, the slides are typically made available to them uh, in advance of the lecture, and they might be taking notes on their own on the material, but of course they may be doing something else, mm -hmm. and it's really hard to tell. Uh, it's not anymore for most of us a, dis a distraction, but it's a potential, I think, distractor yeah. for the students. Yeah, uh, and this is uh, another common question about uh, whether you should like allow. There's a number of faculty, growing number of faculty, who don't allow electronics in the classroom at all for that very, very reason. Uh, and there's a very well-known study uh, that came out about three or four years ago by uh, Danny Oppenheimer and, and, and Pam Mueller, look comparing uh, note-taking on laptop versus note-taking by hand. Uh, so they had like students do one or the other watching TED Talks and they were asked either factual or conceptual questions. What they found was that um, uh, was that uh, the students were, uh, whether they took notes by laptop or, or uh, by hand, uh, there was no difference in factual, simple questions, but for conceptual questions actually taking notes by hand was actually superior. Even though uh, taking notes by laptop, they took more extensive notes, they took more verbatim notes, they didn't learn the material as well. Uh, and uh, you can understand that in terms of depth of processing, which actually uh, I'm going to get to hopefully, <laughs> uh, uh, and, and where uh, taking notes on laptop makes it easy to take dictation without actually really thinking about it. Uh, and therefore, you're actually not learning it well. So uh, actually, uh, students who aren't good at taking notes are at a disadvantage taking notes on uh, by laptop. So. You know, so that's why some, some faculty just simply uh, don't allow electronics. I think that may be a bit extreme. I kind of uh, uh, haven't gone to that point yet, but um, I think, uh, you know, did, there's always an upside and a downside to technology, and the downside can really, like, distractions, uh, but also just simply it making it easy to not learn effectively. That's always a, an issue. I kind of have a... a a solution in my mind that I, I haven't put to the test yet, uh, where 
you know, you have like an electronics-free zone in the classroom. Uh, there, you know, for it's that way, and it's the center, so that way the students who want to use technology are off to the side, uh, and that way they don't distract everyone else when they're, when they're multitasking. But then students sign an agreement that if they make like a C or worse on the exam, they have to sit in the technology free zone. Uh, so that way they have to earn the right to, to sit over, over there. Uh, the advantage of that, uh, quite frankly, is the fact that some students actually are good with technology. And you always have to worry about accommodations. There are some students who need the technology. And you don't want to single them out if you have a technology-free policy. So uh, that's kind of what, but I haven't put that to the test yet. If someone wants to try it, that'd be, that'd be great. Yeah, Alexa. There's a group in Canada who, in the classroom, they don't have Wi-Fi mm -hmm. in the classroom. So Wi-Fi is blocked in the classroom. And students have to download all of their notes before entering into the classroom. So they can use their technology while they're in the classroom, but they don't have the ability to go on the internet, go on Facebook, get to those distractors via the internet. Yeah. So yeah, some class that was a solution uh, at least for a while where you you, you block the Wi-Fi in the classroom. Now students have d you know data plans, so it's it kind of defeats that, you know, and so it makes it even more distracting because they're waiting for their video to download. It takes longer without the Wi-Fi, so they're sitting there watching the the little icon spin. Uh, while, while doing that. So, okay, so let's, let's uh, uh, move on. I'm going to, this just shows all the distractions that we have uh, that, um, you know, in the dorm especially. So every distraction is five minutes minimum. Uh, the average Facebook visit is about 20 minutes. So uh, students think, well, I'll just look at this for a few minutes, and of course, uh, it, you know, turns into longer, longer time. Okay. So uh, let's talk about uh, uh, metacognition uh, here next. Let's see how we're, we're doing for time. Um, metacognition uh, for educators basically is, is students' awareness of his or her level of, of mastery of a, of a topic, of understanding of a topic. Um, so this is the student's judgment about how well they really understand the material. Um, so this distinguishes between stronger and weaker students. Uh, stronger students have excellent metacognition. They know when they've mastered material, and they uh, uh, will stop when they've mastered it. Weaker students have poor metacognition. They tend to be overconfident. Uh, that means they start too late, uh, and they, they, they stop too early. Okay, so they think they've mastered material when, in fact, their understanding is very uh, 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 superficial, and it has gaps in uh, in it, but they believe that they have um, a good understanding. Uh, students with poor metacognition, those are the ones who come up to you a after an exam and say, I I'm just stunned that I made this D because I felt I was really prepared going into it. That's the students with poor metacognition. Um, now, if you do work with traditional high school students, uh, the problem they've got is they have a level of, me of metacognitive awareness that was, that was functional in high school. Then they come to the college level and it's completely uh, dysfunctional. If you work in the medical school or graduate level, you have exactly the same problem. Students come in with a certain metacognitive level and then it's dysfunctional at this higher level. Okay? All right. So let me show you how this works in practice. Uh, when I teach general psych, uh, at the end of the first uh, class, uh, at the end of the first exam, I have this question on there, uh, you know, self-rating. Just tell me your best uh, estimate of the percentage of questions you got correct, zero to 100 percent, right, uh, for this test. So then I can um, plot this against how they actually did. So down here is how the students actually did, zero to 100 percent, okay? And then up here, this is how they thought they did. This is their, their judgment of how well they did. So they have good metacognition. They should fall right along the diagonal here. Okay, their uh, judgment should match their actual performance. And there are some people who are who are uh, on the diagonal. Okay, so for example, if you look up here at the students who did really really well, this, the best students scored 90 to 100 percent. You can see they're clustered around the diagonal. Those students knew they did well, and they in fact they did do well. Then you have the students who are down here. These are the students who actually did better than they thought. All right, so these are the students who, uh, you know, they took the exam and they were worried, but they actually got this pleasant surprise that they did better. Notice there aren't a lot of students down here. Uh, these students are practicing what's called strategic pessimism, where they, uh, you know, hope for the best but prepare for the worst. All right, and this is a, a very uh, adaptive mindset to have if you're a student. 
But look at these students right here. These are my like D and F students here, 50 and 60. And these students have the poorest metacognition, right? So this poor student, for example, here thought that uh, he or she had aced the exam when in fact they made like a D or an F. When I talk to students, I say, see this person? Don't be this person, right? Uh, so these students have very poor metacognition. And this is just not simply wishful thinking. There is research uh, which um, you take students with poor metacognition and you offer them like a $20 Amazon gift card if they can, on the next exam, be more accurate in their judgment of, uh, of how well they understand material, and they can't do it. Okay, This is a genuine, sincere belief that they have. And if you do manipulations like, you know, you can have a cheat sheet. So some people like, you can have one page of formulas or one page of facts you can bring in with you. Students with poor metacognition pick the irrelevant facts you know, to learn. Uh, some teachers will do things like, okay, there's 105 items here and you can like, uh, you know, uh, eliminate five questions of your choice. Students with poor metacognition are just as likely to eliminate questions they got correct as questions they got incorrect. So this poor metacognition is not just simply, opt, you know, mindless optimism. This is a sincere belief that they understand when they really don't. Okay. These students are the ones who confuse misconceptions they've learned outside of classes with what you've actually taught. Yeah? So is there no cure? I mean, is there any, any way to, to bring that person to poor medication? It, it actually takes, uh, it takes uh, sort of months to a year to correct this. Okay, so, so the question is, how do you help someone with, with this? All right, uh, something I'm not going to talk about, and I meant to talk about this morning, but I ran out of time, is, is formative assessments. And I'm sure Ralph will be able to, and Tasha will be able to talk to you about formative assessments, uh, where it makes students aware of their level of understanding. So these are things, actually, they're very good for, like, focusing attention also. And, it's, and they're very good for help for learning uh, that will uh, make the student aware that they don't understand. So there are very effective methods of, of helping out with this. But what, what's going to happen uh, is that the student just has to be aware. It's not that you're going to correct their metacognition right away. It's that they have to be aware that, that they're really grossly overestimating how much they know. So they actually have to over-prepare more than, you know, and, and you know, this is exactly the arguments I have with my teenage son. It's like, you know, you have to, you know, it's not enough to, to think you, you know it. You've got to go beyond that. You've got to practice more. You've got to study more than you really think you need to, right, until they, that metacognition catches up with it. Yeah, Ralph. Yes. I, so I noticed this is Econ 101, yeah. maybe a freshman, sophomore. Mm -hmm. how, has there been studies that show how this might work towards seniors or for a lot of us medical students or folks who are advanced training? Is it going to see a similar pattern here? That is a great question, and I am not aware of this. So there is a real opportunity uh, for you all to see if, if, if you get this exact same pattern. I'd be curious to know. If you do it, let me know. Uh, and that, that raises a question. Uh, I'm a psychologist. I don't teach macroeconomics, but this is from Econ 101. But I'm at a small school, and so the examples I have are like classes of, of 50. Right? So uh, I published a paper uh, that kind of talked about this. Uh, and there was an economist at Penn State who said, well, that may be true at that small southern school, but it's not true at Penn State. So he did this, uh, this in his macro, two sections of macroeconomics, 400 each, and he got these results. He was so amazed, he sent them to me uh, and said, look, this, you know, this happens like everywhere. And uh, I said, you know, this is great. Like, this is this great data set. Can I use it when I give talks? And he goes, yes, but please don't mention this is Penn State because we don't want to like uh, advertise that our students are, are uh, like overconfident, right? And so I actually gave this talk without mentioning where it's from, but I actually talked at Penn State and, and I asked him about it, he goes, okay, that's fine. It's well enough known now that you can actually say that it's from Penn State. So that's why it's from macroeconomics, yeah. Sorry to ask another question. No, that's fine. Um, you know, uh, the question is like is the difference in demographics, like background or, yeah, and um, that's a really good question because uh, that, you know, gets it like non-traditional returning students and, and things like that. Uh, and I'm not aware of, of any sort of demographic uh, uh, differences. I, I, so it's not saying they don't have them. I just don't know if there's any research on this. Uh, but, but 
you know, one thing I am aware of since I teach at a traditional four-year college is that, uh, you know, the big problem is that, that, that I run into is that students come in with this highly overlearned, really, you know, inappropriate sense of metacognition. And uh, so I'm suspecting that medical schools may have that, that same issue, but I don't know. And so there's a real, if you're interested in medical education, there's a real research opportunity for you. Okay. Okay. All right. So the irony of poor metacognition uh, is that uh, people have no cl uh, clue as to how weak their understanding of a concept is, right? Uh, and this is a, a, uh, a general uh, principle that uh, a big part of, of being incompetent is not realizing how incompetent that you are, right? Uh, so uh, if you take virtually any skill and you look at the, the bottom uh, quartile of that skill and you ask people to rate themselves, they'll usually rate themselves in the uh, second or, or top quartile in that skill. So this is the reason why uh, when we teach, you know, the freshmen are often more confident about what they know than the seniors are if we do our job correctly. The seniors should really realize just how ignorant they are, how much that we don't know, right? So the freshmen are overconfident because of their poor metacognition, right? Uh, and you see this all the time where, like, uh, it, originally it was studied in, in uh, people's uh, sense of whether they're funny or not. So the people who are not funny at all tend to think they're just hilarious, and people who are, think they're really socially skilled and tactful are completely tactless. And, and so, you know, the more you know, the more you realize what you really don't know. Okay. All right. And this is something that we, that we are, are always uh, battling. And by the way, this holds true for teachers as well. So uh, the, the teachers who most needed to come to this day and find out about how to teach properly are the ones who think, oh, I'm pretty good at teaching. I don't have to come and do this sort of thing. So you were to be congratulated because you, obviously you are the elite at Aug uh, Augustana University. <laughs> okay. All right. So uh, we're running out of time, and I don't really mind because these are great questions, but I do want to kind of get to... Uh, 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 some other concepts here. So now let's let's just test your mindset. We kind of talked about student mindset that you need to be aware of. Let's test your mindset uh, and your your beliefs. So um, what I want you to do is I want you to uh, look at this list of five uh, uh, possible ingredients, and I want you to pick the single most important ingredient for learning. So just do this quietly uh, to yourself. Okay, everyone. Everyone got, uh, got their answer? Now what we're going to do is I'm going to count to three. And on the count of three, everyone's going to hold up their hand with uh, their uh, number of fingers indicating their answer from one to five. Okay? We're going to do this together. We're all going to participate. Uh, so we're going to do this simultaneously so that way you can't do what students always want to do, which is to wait and see what everyone else says first before kind of, <laughs> kind of uh, chiming in. Okay? So uh, are you ready? All right, one, two, three. Put up your hands. Okay, so I see ones. There's a, uh, two, lots of ones. Okay, some threes and some fours and some fives, right? So basically, there's absolutely no consensus whatsoever uh, as to uh, what the correct answer is. So what does that mean? Well, to me, it means that whatever the correct answer is, the majority of you probably got it wrong, right? <laughs> and what that if you got it wrong, then that, that influences your... Uh, uh, your uh, teaching, the effect of your teaching. So let's kind of uh, talk about what the correct answer is. And we're going to do a little demonstration here. Uh, it's going to take some time, but I want to do it anyway. Uh, move on your handout uh, to uh, that grid, that perceptual judgment task uh, on the, this, the, the, third page, the second page, the, the third uh, sheet of the, the handout here. Okay, so... Um, Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to divide the room in half. So roughly, let's say uh, this row, uh, this line over is one half of the room, and then from this gentleman uh, in the lab coat over is the other half of the room, okay? All right, I'm going to read a list of, of 24 words to you, and I want you uh, either to do uh, one of two things. So if you're on this side of the room, then you are going to uh, check yes if the word has an E or a G in it, no if it doesn't. Okay? All right. So for this half of the room, you're going to check uh, yes if the word is pleasant and no if the word is not pleasant. Right? So if the word is a uh, 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 desk, let's say, okay, what are you going to check? Yes, right? Because it got an E in it, right? Desk, pl uh, pleasant, yes or no? No. Hate your desk. Okay. All right. Have a beef with your desk. Okay. If it's orange, yes or no? 
Okay, orange. Yeah, like oranges. Okay, mountain. No. Okay, mountain. Yeah, like mountains. Okay, good. All right, so everyone kind of is clear what we're doing? All right, so I'm going to read this list pretty quickly. You just check yes or no for each one. Uh, I'm going to go pretty quickly, so you got to pay attention. Ready? Here we go. Number one, evening. Number two, country. Number three, salt. Number four, easy. Number five, peace. Number six, morning. Number seven, pretty. Number eight, expensive. Number nine, poor. Number 10, doctor. Number 11, city. Number 12, dry. Number 13, cold. Number 14, love. Number 15, bargain. Number 16, war. Number 17, hate. Number 18, wet. Number 19, rich. Number 20, nurse. Number 21, pepper. Number 22, hard. Number 23, ugly. Number 24, hot. Okay, how'd that go? Was that easy or was that hard to do? One of the easier things you'll, you've done, right? Okay, sounds good? All right, so <clears throat> here's the next part of the demonstration. I want you to write down as many of the 24 words that I said that you can remember. Okay, so write down as many of the 24 words as you can remember. And the, the three test words don't count. Okay, so uh, as many of the 24 words as you can remember. Uh, sorry, what? Oh, it does this kind of thing? Yeah. Okay, there were 24 of them, right? So I know it's hard to get that 23rd and 24th word. So uh, just keep uh, writing down as many as you remember. If you reach the end of what you can remember, though, uh, just count the number of words that you got. Right. Uh, if you're still recalling, that's fine. Just keep going. Okay, people are still writing down? That's fine if you are. Let me know if you need more time. <laughs> That's fine. If you reach the uh, end of what you can remember, just go ahead and count up the number you got. Okay. Anybody need more time? Everyone got? Okay. So let me just kind of explain what you just did. You did a, uh, an exercise in something called levels of processing. This is a model of memory that was popular in about the 1970s. It's no longer current in psychology, but it's very useful for teachers and students to know. Uh, it uh, looks at memory as, as, as a set of, uh, of, of levels, a, a continuum of levels that vary in depth, okay, from shallow to deep. Shallow levels of processing focus on spelling, appearance, and sound, okay, like rote memorization of facts, just meaningless uh, characteristics, okay? And uh, shallow processing does not lead to long-term recall. Deeper processing focuses on subjective meaning. You relate this information to what you already know, okay? Uh, you uh, make information personally meaningful. And the deeper you process information, the more likely you are to remember it, okay? So 
Uh, remember I had you do these two different tasks. So E versus G checking in depth of processing, would that be a shallow or a deep task? It would be shallow, right? Because you're looking at spelling. So this is a shallow uh, processing task. Versus pleasantness, you're actually having to think like, what's my experience with these sorts of things? So that's a, a deep processing task. You're relating the words uh, to your own meaningful experiences, right? So um, what you uh, just experienced was called an orienting task. An orienting task is a way for sneaky psychologists like myself uh, to force you to process information at a deep or shallow level, whether you want to or not. Okay, so half of you process it deeply, half of you process it in a shallow way. Shall we see how well you learned? Okay, uh, so what I want you to do is I want you to raise your hand and keep it raised if you remembered at least uh, three words or more. So three words or more, raise your hand. Good, that's most everyone, right? Uh, six words or more, keep your hands up, six words or more. Uh, nine words or more, nine words or more. Ooh, losing people uh, there. So where have I lost them? Pretty much over here, 12 words or more. 12 words, okay, I've still uh, just a few people over here, 15 words or, or more, okay, I have lost, I've got a couple, I've got, actually, Ken, you're the only one there in, the, in that group now, uh, okay, uh, but I've still got the majority of people here, let's say 18 words or more, 18 words, okay, okay, well, I've still got a really good memory, how many did you get? 23, excellent, congratulations. <laughs> I have nothing for you, but congratulations. <laughs> so uh, anyway, but do you notice who remembered more, right? Plus it was the deep level of processing. Now, it was a surprise to all of you, right, that, that recall task, but your deep level of processing led to better recall. This is actually um, uh, sort of a, uh, based on, on some class research by Hyde and Jenkins, uh, which did uh, a shallow level of e-checking versus deep uh, level, and they got the exact same finding that deep processing led to much better recall. Uh, you did what's called incidental learning, where uh, the, uh, you didn't know there was going to be a recall task, and that is the red bars. The blue bars, though, are people who were warned about recall, and it didn't make a difference at all. Okay, So even though uh, the people knew about recall, if they used shallow strategies, they didn't learn. Okay, so. If you use deep strategy, it didn't matter if you knew there was going to be a study, uh, uh, there's going to be a test or not. You still learn just as well as if you knew there was going to be a test. Even if you knew there was a test, use shallow strategies. You didn't learn. Depth of processing matters. Okay, how you process information. Now, the concept of orienting task here is a very valuable one for teachers. Think of your assignments and activities as orienting tasks. Right? What is this assignment making my students think about? Right? If your assignments are forcing your students to think in a deep, meaningful way, you're actually helping them to learn. But if your assignments make them think in a shallow way, if it's like mindless repetition or writing things out, you're actually hurting their learning. Okay? They may be intending to learn, they may want to learn, but if they use shallow strategies, they're not going to learn very effectively. Okay? Right. So um, deep processing is, is what really matters. So. Uh, getting back to the, uh, uh, the key ingredient, does intention and desire to learn matter? Well, actually, no, it doesn't. It, uh, it does not uh, uh, overcome poor study strategies. So you can be highly motivated to learn. You can put in hours and hours of work. But if you use poor study strategies, you're not going to learn. The way I say this is that good intentions cannot overcome bad study strategies. So we need to uh, teach our students not only content, but how to think about that content, how to study that content at a deep level. It will actually uh, help their, their learning a lot. Okay, paying close attention to the material as you study. Well, actually, uh, you all were paying attention. I told you to pay attention, right? So paying attention is necessary, but it's not sufficient. It's not enough to learn. You can pay attention at a shallow level. Okay, learning a way that matches your personal learning style. Uh, you've probably heard a lot about learning styles being uh, kinesthetic learners, being auditory learners versus visual learners. There's actually a lot of good research on this, and the research shows that learning styles are basically a myth. There's absolutely nothing to them. Okay, uh, that people like to learn in many, many different ways. Right. Um, so there's there's just not a single way that people learn. People may learn. Uh, best in uh, uh, like math in one way, uh, history in a different way, biology a third way. 
Okay, it's not simple like you have this one learning style. Not only is there no empirical basis for it, uh, I, I think it's kind of uh, counterproductive because uh, it reinforces that fixed mindset. You know, if I'm a kinesthetic learner, I can only learn in this way, and I can't learn in any other way. We do our students a disservice if we reinforce that. What we want our students to do is learn in as many different ways as possible. We nurture multiple ways of learning, so that way they'll be able to learn in whatever situation that they're, that they're in. So learning styles is, is uh, just very popular in secondary and elementary education. Uh, and it is simply something that, that, is, that has no empirical basis. On your uh, handout, I've got a video that you can watch uh, that kind of explains the, the problems with learning styles if you want to learn more about it. I don't mean to be glib uh, in saying there's nothing to them, um, but the, the evidence just simply doesn't support them. Okay, uh, the time you spend while studying, okay, that wasn't uh, uh, important. So what's the correct answer? It's what you think about while studying. Right? So did you think about information in a meaningful way? By the way, did you notice something about the list? What was it? They're opposites. Okay, well, yeah, some were opposite, they're pairs, right? So there was like nurse, doctor, hot, cold. Okay, chances are a number of you over here didn't even notice that, right? So if you did notice it, then chances are that helped you. But I imagine everyone in the deep processing noticed it. And when we teach, don't we want our students to make those connections? Hey, wait a minute, that reminds me of something else you talked about, or how does it relate to other kinds of, of information? You can't do that. Students can't do that if they're processing information at a shallow level, right? So we want to reinforce that deeper level of, of, of processing, okay? Right. Um, I, I got six minutes. You get zero minutes. Oh, oh, that's right, I'm going to 11, and so sorry about that. Um, so I did about 10.50, I was thinking 11 o'clock, so, all right. So hopefully that uh, is, is useful uh, uh, to you. And um, uh, if uh, you are interested in, in more, I've got both uh, a video series on, on how to study, and I've got a video series that, that goes over this on, on the cognitive base of effective teaching. So I uh, urge you to check those out if you want to learn more. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Tu. Uh, just a little bit of a backstory. Ralph and I spend a lot of time thinking about where the field of medical education needs to go, where our faculty and staff are currently with their understanding of educational theory and pedagogical knowledge, and how we can move everyone forward as an institution. So we looked at quite a few different speakers for Education Day. We had maybe a list of six or seven. We searched each one and then eliminated all of them and came up with Dr. Chu. So it seemed to us that, that you found his work very engaging and very helpful. And this is meant to be the beginning of many conversations around medical education. So thank you very much for your work. We are going to be moving into round tables next. Uh, I would encourage you to use the bathroom, get some coffee if you need to, um, and then come back to where you are before we start to disperse into individual activities. Okay, thanks. See you in just a couple of minutes.